Uh, so tonight, uh, I'm going to talk about a few things that are kind of dear to our hearts as functional programmers. So uh, I'm going to talk about proofs, for one thing. Uh, typically, when we talk about proofs in functional programming, we're talking about proving something with like Haskell types, or maybe by uh, running a program in Coq, and then letting the, the automated tool like check our proof. And tonight, I'm going to talk about a little bit <coughs> different type of proof. Um, there's some problems uh, that I've run into where I wanted to prove things, but I found it very difficult to even begin to formulate what I want to prove in the system like Haskell types or in, in Coq. Um, so I think it's going to be a little different look at, at proof. Um, and the way we're going to approach this proof is through another thing that we talk about a lot as functional programmers, which is through DSL, the main specific language, um, and then Haskell. So the talk uh, is in Haskell. Uh, hopefully, you understand some basic Haskell programming. There's nothing too fancy. Um, there's also going to be a little bit of physics. Um, if you don't remember last time you had the course in mechanics, don't panic. Uh, you don't have to understand every detail. Uh, I'm going to talk about a library called SPV. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you everything about how to use this library because it has great docs and great examples. I mainly want to tell you uh, the cool things you can do with it, and I want to show you why it's cool. <coughs> so, uh, uh, one more caveat is that uh, I'm not an expert at this. Uh, I, everything I know about this, I learned from using this library and trying to prove uh, theorems like the kind of extended example. I'll show you in a little bit. So it's possible I'll say something a little wrong, and if you hear me say something that you know is wrong, just say that's wrong and tell us what's going on, please. Okay. Let's see. Question? Oh, yeah, great, okay. So here's uh, sort of the outline for the talk. We're going to talk about a little bit of theory. So SAT, SMT, SPV, what do they stand for? Uh, why do we care what they are? and why do they all start with S? Then uh, I'm going to show you some things you can prove using an SMT solver. Um, I'm going to do some simple examples, <coughs> and then I want to do sort of an extended example, which is motivated by something I'm thinking a lot about at work, which is I want to prove, I, I want to do a stability proof for a feedback controller for a physical system. Um, and after that, uh, I want to briefly touch on a few other things you can do with SMT solvers, and specifically with SPV. <coughs> Ready? Okay, so the first theory topic, SAT. So SAT means Boolean satisfiability. So it's a simple problem. Uh, for some formula involving logical variables and logical connectives, is there any assignment of true and false to those variables for which the statement is true? So here's, here's an example. <coughs> A, B, and C are variables, so we have A and B or non-C, right? So this is a very simple SAT problem. So who can tell me whether this is satisfiable? Okay, I see some thumbs up. Yes, this, this is satisfiable, right? If A and B are true, then it returns true. Doesn't matter what it says. <coughs> Um, so why do we care? Well, there's some theoretical interest. So this was the first problem that was proved to be complete. So this means that uh, there's no, unless p equals np, there's no polynomial time algorithm to solve general problems like that. And when I say polynomial time, I mean time in the length of the input formula. So like the number of variables and connectives we have. Um, it's also a practical interest. Uh, there are uh, a number of problems where this corresponds to some useful property to prove. One big domain where this is useful is uh, Boolean logic in like digital semiconductors. So you can have some digital circuit and you can prove things about it using SAT solver, okay. uh, off the shelf piece of software that will solve this problem pretty efficiently for a lot of practical problems. So this has like some practical application as well as sort of the complexity theory interest. Everybody happy with SAT? Great. Okay, so now we're going to uh, nest the acronym. We're going to go SMT, SAT, Modular Theories. So, 
this is pretty similar, but instead of having just Boolean logical variables like A, B, and C, now we're going to say replace those variables with some predicate, so some expression that evaluates to a Boolean. And that expression may contain, uh, maybe based on some more complicated theory than Boolean logic. So in this case, right, our more complicated theory maybe is like integer arithmetic, or maybe it's real number arithmetic, maybe it's floating pointer arithmetic. No, we don't know yet. These two could actually, no, no, they can't, because X isn't better. Uh, so here's uh, a number of more complicated theories that standard SMT solvers support. <coughs> So in addition to different types of numbers, we have like arrays, we have like bit vectors and fixed size, uh, strings in some solvers, uh, and there's also a theory called uninterpreted functions, which uh, is kind of interesting. The only thing you know about an uninterpreted function is that it's refer referentially transparent, but it turns out that if you know this, you can still actually do useful proofs on it. I'm not surprised anyone who's worked with this kind of uh, referential transparency before, but <clears throat> so uh, these are some of the things we can do in SMT, and so uh, why do we care? Because uh, we can solve much more complicated problems than we can with SAT solver, and we can do it automatically. So there's off-the-shelf software that will take a description of any problem in this class and do its best to solve it. Uh, so there's a standard interface to these solvers called SMT that surprise. And SMT, like, this is a graph of the different theories that are standard in SMT. Like, I think this is actually a little bit out of date. Uh, I don't see floating point on here, but that's definitely supported now. Um, but, so, here, so here's examples of, these are the more complicated theories that can go into the slots in the, in the SAT uh, statement. So we could QFBV over there is a quantifier free formulae over the theory of fixed size bit vectors. I'll talk about the quantifier in a second. Um, hmm, this is the little information I was before. Okay. Um, yeah, so QF and IA, nonlinear integer arithmetic, nonlinear meaning, well, you know, nonlinear means in terms of that. Um, FP, BB, so we can start to combine these and you, you uh, the solvers delineate which theories they're going to use because depending on which underlying theories you're trying to ask questions about, the algorithm that they use to solve the problem changes. Okay, uh, quantifier free here mean, uh, means that you cannot have logical quantifiers inside the individual segments. So I think this is the same thing as in Haskell saying you can only have rank one types, so you can't, uh, if I'm a Curry Howard fan, maybe correct me if I said that wrong, but uh, basically, you can't say, you can only have a for all or an exist at the top level. So you can say, uh, prove something about this or find a solution to this, but you can't say, you can't quantify it inside that. And you'll notice that some of these theories don't have that QF prefix, which means some solvers can actually tackle that kind of uh, higher rank problem. Okay. I should ask if everyone's okay with SMT so far. Not see anything that's going on. So, okay, SPV will nest again. So, SMT based verification. So, it's still the same S, that's why I'll start with this. Um, so, this is a Haskell DSL for working with SMT solvers. Uh, it, can, it can interface to many different solvers. There's a bunch of them, most are free, you can just download them. Uh, Z3 is from Microsoft Research, it's probably the, the, the one with the most features. Um, and S, SPV lets you set up problems and send them to SMT solvers, but it, it lets you deal with different, different types of problems. So you can do constraint solving, you can do proofs, uh, you can do optimization in a limited sense, uh, and it also lets you do other useful things like generate C code, which we'll see in a little bit. Okay, so uh, the next thing I'm gonna do is explain just the basics of how to formulate this kind of problem in SPV, in the domain specific way. Um, again, I'm not going to tell you everything about how this works. I just want to give you the very basics and then we'll jump into some examples and hopefully it will mostly be clear. Okay, so the first thing is we have this type called SPV and 
it takes one parameter and this parameter is sort of whatever type we're reasoning about in our SMT formula predicates, right? So you can have doubles and bulls and integers of different size, sizes. You can have real, which is algebraic reals, and so on. Um, and there's some class that similar, which basically means SMT that understands what this type is. Um, one kind of annoying thing about DSLs in Haskell that some of you may have run into is that a lot of the standard classes are parameterized over everything except bool. And you, you can't replace bool in, for example, if then else syntax or an EQ, you, you're stuck on bool. So SPV defines a lot of equivalence of, um, of <coughs> just reasoning about, reasoning about booleans and then equality, there's a class called mergeable, which you don't have to care too much about the methods of the class. It's needed to implement things like if then else. We'll see this in a little bit. But so the, this is another thing you need to understand when you're working with SPV is that the booleans have all been abstracted over, so it doesn't look exactly like a normal Haskell program. Um, and then uh, the last part I want to tell you about is that we have this <coughs> symbolic type that is like a, it's basically the context for doing symbolic reasoning, setting up SMT problems. Um, so it's an instance of functor applicative mono, and, and uh, we'll, we'll see how that works in just a second. But uh, there's two, two main things you're going to see me do with it. One is introduce uh, symbolic variables to reason about. So there's S double, which introduces a single double I'm going to reason about. There's S bools, which takes a series of strings, and I can introduce a whole bunch of variables at once. And there, there's flavors of these for every type that I want to deal with. And then there's also a constraint. So I can say some predicate and uh, constrain the solution to only where that predicate falls. Anybody really lost? Okay, let's start simple. Uh, addition is associative. Who uh, wants a refresher on what associativity is? Great. Um, so here's how we ask SPV to solve this, to prove this for us. So it's approved, and now we're in this <coughs> symbolic uh, reasoning monad, and we'll say, please give me some uh, symbolic double precision numbers that I want to reason about. And then I have this thing that returns an overloaded, overloaded version of a boolean, and that's the theorem that I want to prove. So I just say prove this, and oops. Well, I asked for doubles, so the problem is infinity times infinity times negative infinity is not a number, which doesn't look very equal in itself. So, okay, let's do a constraint. So, here we'll just save the numbers as a list, same symbolic variables we introduced, but now we're just going to fold over them with end. This triple end is the overloaded uh, version of the normal end. And we're just going to say fp is point, which basically means it's not an end, it's not completed. So we constrain all these numbers to not be infinity in that. So now we should look through this. Like so floating point numbers are associated. I'm sure many of you have been bitten by this before. So okay, let's try again. Let's do S integers. Okay. So QED is what gets printed out in the command line when you, when you say approve or whatever. So now we're happy with this, at least integers are still like what it's saying. Question so far is basic structure about how you do proof. Okay. So uh, before we do the long example, uh, there's SPV's documentation is great. If you want to learn how I'm not gonna tell you how to this how to use this library, if you want to learn how to use it, go on go and look up the addicts because it's the documentation is really complete. It's really helpful, and there's also a ton of examples. Some of the examples are really complicated. So there's like merge sort one, which is not that complicated. There's one from like the 60s, I think, where some guy published some amazing assembly algorithm for doing major multiplication using whatever the built-in instructions were. So one of their examples is they formalize the architecture, and then they prove that this guy's algorithm always gives the correct answer. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, there's a, there's a whole bunch of cool examples, so I encourage you to check them out. 
<clears throat> but um, what I want to jump into next is I want to I want to focus on one example, and I think it's interesting specifically because it's not the kind of uh, theorem that I find that I'm able to prove easily using standard FP tools. Um, I don't really know how to deal with this kind of thing in Coq, certainly not in the Haskell's type system. Um, and I think it's probably a little different from proofs you've seen before, so I hope it's interesting. Um, so what, what we're going to do is we're going to look at a dynamical system, pendulum, and we're going to design a feedback controller for it. I'll talk a little more about what that means in a minute. And then we're going to uh, prove that it's that our feedback controller will stabilize the system. So um, we need some assumptions to base our proof on. So we're going to assume that we have an accurate enough model to capture everything relevant to stability. Um, we're going to assume that we know the model parameters. And we're going to assume that we can measure the state exactly. Um, turns out there's some useful theorems in yeah, control systems and it says that the third one is actually usually not a problem. It's far more than that. The other ones would be going around. Um, okay, so here's the strategy. We're going to look at the dynamics first. We're going to show what it looks like in Haskell. Then we're going to talk about controlling the system with a, with a feedback controller. We're going to write that in Haskell. Then we're going to talk, talk about how you prove stability on this kind of system very, uh, without going into a lot of detail. And then we're going to write that in Haskell. And then we're going to plug it all into SPP console fingers and wait for a long time. I won't make you wait, but I have to Okay. Sound good? Questions? Ready? Here's a pendulum. Um, it's inverted. So the pendulum has a mass on the end. The mass is chem. Uh, the pendulum arm is L meters long. G is the gravitational constant. Our coordinate system is we can rotate this way, so into the page or to the right for, for you guys, and that's that's positive. And we're going to represent the rotation angle by theta. And the only other piece of the system is we have a motor at the uh, axis of rotation, and this motor lets us apply a torque called tau. So that's what we're going to use to control the system. Okay, so. This is the dynamics written as a differential equation. So this is just Newton's law, so F equals MA, but it's rotational, so the M is actually a moment of inertia, and the A is an alpha, it's angular acceleration. But all the forces are on the right, so we've got three terms. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, here's our, so this is our angle that we talked about on the last slide. Uh, omega is the time derivative of our angle, that's our rotational velocity. Alpha is the time derivative of our velocity, so it's the acceleration. Uh, tau is up, so now we've got the three forces on the right. Tau is our input torque from our motor. Sorry, force of torque is the torque because it's rotating. Uh, the first term there, B omega, is a damping, so that means that we have some friction force proportional to how fast we're going. It's fighting against our rotation. And then the middle one is gravity, so that's the gravity and torque is going to be proportional to the angle away from vertical. So if we're standing straight up, then they get zero. The sine of zero is zero. It means we've got no torque, which is right. Uh, and I think I mentioned this. <coughs> if you're not totally on top of this, don't worry, you don't have to. Okay, so let's do some types. So this is basically what we saw. Uh, we got four parameters. We got the length of the pendulum, the mass of the pendulum, the damping constant, the gravity. You see how the pendulum in space. Do that adjustable. And then uh, the state vector is two states, the rotation angle and the rotation vector. Don't worry about the controller yet. Okay, so here's the Hopper function. I should have asked if anyone remembers this from the this is the moment of inertia, the point mass at some length. So and you can see anything about that. So here we're going to implement this differential equation. This is the same equation we saw on the last page. I just added the state. I've written the equation for the whole state vector. Uh, you can do some algebra and get from there to there. 
And that's where we just have to provide the differential equation for both states if you want to see that. I'm not going to get into more details here. Um, but so here's the implementation in Haskell. It's actually pretty similar. Uh, we got our uh, gravity turn, we got our damping turn, we got our torque turn, and we're going to produce, so we're taking a state vector and taking the system specification, and we're going to produce a new state vector, which is the derivative. Everyone sort of maybe see what's going on here? Questions? Okay. So, I simulated it for you. So, what's happening? Can someone tell me what's happening here? Can you see those numbers? Okay, there's a hint. This is about negative pi, and the other two are about pi. So the pendulum, right, it, we didn't put any torque in, we just simulated it in free fall for a few different initial conditions at the top, and it just swings down and it kind of slowly damps down. No surprises. Also plotted the, uh, the velocity, so you can see this really takes a little while to decay. Okay. Is this sort of, the system make sense to people? Are happy so far? Okay, let's uh, make it do what we want. So, uh, if we were going to control this, we have to choose uh, what torque tau we're going to command with the motor. So, we're going to come up with a feedback plot. It's called feedback because you measure the state and you feed it back to calculate the torque you're going to put into the system. So, we're going to come up with a feedback plot. It's a function of the state. It's two states that determines the torque that we give. So, x, I'm going to write x a few times for the state vector. That's like the state type of the data and then we're going to continue. Okay, so what's the goals for the control, right? We want it to stand up because if we just want it to hang down, we already did that. So let's stand up. It's not, st and the interesting thing is that it's not stable around standing up point. So then that makes proving stability a little more interesting. This is, by the way, this is not a super interesting system. Every control engineer is required to be like in intimately and comfortably familiar with this system, but it's small enough that you can do it in a talk like this. So, so we want it to stand up. What else? We want it to not move around here. Right? So we should stay still. And then the stability part is that uh, if you started somewhere not standing up or if you push away from standing up, you should go back there and not wobble. And we also, it would, I mean, this is not great right now. We'd like to just see it go up and stop. So I'm not going to go into a lot of detail around how I uh, come up with this, but I can give you a little physical intuition. So. There's two parts. The first part is negative two in GL sine theta. So, can anyone tell me what that means? The, the first one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this is the same as the gravity term. So if I say minus in GL sine theta, that cancels out gravity. And I say minus two, that adds like a gravity field that goes up, right? So I'm saying I'm just going to take the same dynamics that we had before to hang down. I'm just going to invert it so it goes up. Okay, second part, KD times omega. Anybody? Owen? Sorry. Yeah, it's more damp. So this lets us add another proportional in terms of friction, proportional how fast we're going. Okay, so that part is just to reduce the wobbliness. Okay, so it makes sense. Oh, that's it. All right, and then we just have to do one more thing, which is we have the pendulum function go off from the previous slide where we, or a couple slides ago, where we had the differential equation the pendulum, and it took a torque input. So now we're going to use the controller that we just wrote to and specify the torque of that. So we take the state, we give it to the pendulum differential equation, and we're also going to calculate the torque by this guy. So we get the, this is called the closed loop dynamics, or it's the system, how it behaves once you put the controller attached to measuring the state and commanding the torque. So this, this is the interesting 
system that we want to prove the properties about. Right? We don't care what it does when it's not controlled. We don't care what it does when it is controlled. So this this is the system we're going to analyze. Uh, so I did uh, some simulations for this. That looks a little better. That's the speed. Okay, so who's happy? He's happy. He's happy. Why are you happy? I promise you a proof, and this is like three sample points. It's like three test cases, man. Okay, let's prove it, because I don't want to test every possible point. Okay, so how do you prove stability? We're going to use something uh, from control theory called the Lyapunov's direct method. So the Lyapunov's direct method says <coughs> we can come up with some function v of the state of the system that satisfies three properties. And that's what we're going to prove that these three properties hold for our program that we just wrote. Then the system should be stable. So what are the three properties? So v of zero, zero is the equilibrium point. And happily, somehow it worked out that the coordinate system is based around zero, exactly where we want it to stabilize. Um, so that if v is zero at the equilibrium point, if it's greater than zero everywhere else, and if it's time derivative is always less than or equal to zero, then the system is stable. I'm not, I don't even know how he came up with this, so I can't tell you, but this is the case. Uh, I'm going to state, blatantly assert that this is how it works. Um, so uh, now I have a question. We didn't mention the system values. So how are we going to introduce the group? No. Okay. Um, it comes in when you take the time derivative of the plus but this tripped me up a few times when I was first working with it, so I was I'll leave it here. So when you see it later, you'll understand what's going on. Okay, so maybe I gave something away there. Uh, in general, there is no like automatic way to choose a function v for your system that's guaranteed to give you the result you want. It's not known to be Automatable. Some people have clever ways of automating this for subsets of you know, some, some types of systems. Um, I had a professor in college who spent six years trying to find one of these and gave up because he couldn't for his controller that he was trying to publish. And so it goes. But a good place to start for these is usually energy. So uh, I'm going to just write down the kinetic energy. This is a kinetic energy of mass coming around the masses. Potential energy. This is the potential energy of something going like this. Uh, and I, I've sort of offset the potential energy by one because I want to be able to satisfy this property that V is always greater than zero. Right? So it goes from minus two to zero, which means that when I combine them, I'm going to take the negative of the potential energy. So maybe a little intuition here is that if uh, we want to get rid of the kinetic energy of the pendulum. We don't want it to be moving around. And we want to maximize the potential energy, i.e. stand it straight up. That's kind of how we get, it, get to this. So, question? Uh, everything this on this slide is just applying basic calculus to the last slide. A few, few seconds to look through it if you're interested. But, I'll point out that on the fourth line up there, where we call it state omega, a closed loop system, that's where our dynamics come in to the proof. Anybody totally lost? Okay, so finally we can talk about SPV again. Right? This guy shows up to a programming meetup and he's like, hey guys, look at all this little tech. So let's do some programming. <coughs> So, okay, we're going to do the same thing, this traverse gen state labels, I factored out gen, which is s double or s bool or whatever, because I want to be able to do this proof for different uh, basic types. So, that's what gen's doing, and we're going to take in f and dfdt, which is v and dvdt. These are the two things we need for those three conditions for that last thing. So, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to constrain the state, the rotation angle to be between pi and negative pi. 
because it just wraps, so it doesn't make sense outside that. And then we're just going to do the three parts. So, first condition looks the same. Uh, second condition pretty much, pretty much looks the same. Third condition almost looks the same, except I had to put this in because here I've constrained the state not to be zero ever, so I have to check this separately for the point zero zero. Don't worry too much about it. It almost looks the same. So, okay, we get these three things. Just like before when we made some assertions about associativity, we just have some expressions that return some abstracted over Boolean. And then we just say, and all, all three of these have to be true, and that's our proof. Ready? Oh, yeah, we have to pick a system. So, here's some system parameters that I chose. So, half a meter long, a little bit of damping, lots more damping in the controller, 100 grams. More gravity. Okay, so we're going to pass in S real, which means we're going to do the proof using algebraic real numbers, not floating point numbers. Ask me after class. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're just going to hook in these values for our system that we assume we measured into V into VDT, and we're going to say SPV, please prove this using Z3. Yay, yeah, 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 it's good. Okay, great. So, <clears throat> questions? Things that didn't quite make sense? That's a great question. For this system, it's actually almost instantaneous. Why is that? Because it's not looking at individual values, it's doing algebraic manipulations, because it's working on the theory of algebraic numbers. So this is actually really quick to prove. But, it doesn't correspond to a real implementation because it's on multiple real numbers. Trade offs. What's the smallest amount of work you can do to make it not correct? The smallest amount of work I can do to make it not correct? I would just change the I would just I would just change the sign in the feedback controller. Changes I would change I would go, the smallest thing I can do to make it incorrect is I would go to here and I would change it to plus two and GL sign theta. Um, and if you work with feedback control systems, you learn that you'll always guess the wrong sign first if you guess. <clears throat> okay, so there's a couple little bits I want to talk about before I move on. Um, if you were looking, it didn't use sine and cosine, right? It used Taylor sine and Taylor cosine. So, SMT lib doesn't know about turning metric functions, so I had to use a Taylor series expansion. Oh well. Uh, that's what computers do anyway. Uh, N times L times L, well, it also doesn't know about exponentiation. But for a lot of systems, you just need a few, so no problem. Um, and then pi is the same sort of deal. Actually, pi may be an SMT lib, but SPV does not provide the right instances. So I just really did that. Anyway. That's why some of the weird things showed up before we started. Alright. So Isaac asked like just the right question. <coughs> because the next thing I want to do is we have all this stuff built up. We improve something that's very cool but not doesn't apply to the real thing. So now we're gonna go to some microcontroller that talks to a motor and use like single precision floating point to implement this thing, so maybe we should think about proving things about the actual control. So let's make sure that if we give it finite inputs, we'll always get finite outputs. Finite meaning not infinity and not not number. So we already have the controller. We'll pass it in as F here. And we'll use S float for a uh, single precision. The, the, the S is for SPV, not some close 32 bits. Right. So we'll constrain the state to be in the right place. <coughs> We're going to constrain the inputs, the input state vector to all be not NAND and not infinity. 
and then we just say, well, the output better be, the output torque better also not be manually limited. And this, this is not dealing with algebraic real numbers to up 10 hours on a laptop. <laughs> it's a 10th order Taylor series, which is probably most of the, most of the work. But yeah, this took a little while. But happily, it was good. Questions on this one? Okay, so now we just proved this great thing for our like, microcontroller implementation and some decision float. So now we have to prove on the microcontroller. So I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but we have another one that looks almost like the symbolic one that we can use to ask SPV to generate C code. Here is the C code. What is that? That's all the Taylor series. So let's separate it out. So what we can do is we can separately code generate one function and bring it into Haskell in a way that SPV knows about it so that it'll generate the C the Haskell function call as a C function call to the separate generated code. So we'll just add this emit our function that we need into our code generation. And then we can use the CGM interpret function from SPV to say, okay. If I call it in Haskell, use the last argument. <coughs> if I call it in C, the function that you need to call is that string argument. Don't worry about the middle one. That's for like adding extra junk around it. Um, so now we can call it in Haskell, and we can do proofs on it just like we did before, but now when we go to code generate it, it won't put all of that junk in the middle of a thing. We'll just generate Taylor signs separately and then. Now it starts to make sense, right? Now we have our two times mass times length times sine of theta, right, and so on. So I think this is pretty cool. This is very useful for me. It generates code that doesn't use the heap, and it always takes the same amount of time every time you call it. It's, every, it's already in like SSA form. Every line is just like one operation on the sign. <coughs> um, so this is pretty handy. Another useful thing to elaborate and for uh, yeah, any questions on um, this proof? Controllers? No. Happy? Was that, hopefully that was interesting to people. It's a little different than like sort of reduction on algebraic data types, which is very useful in some contexts and not very useful in others. <coughs> okay, so now let's talk about constraint solving. So this is totally unrelated to the last half an hour of our talking about that. Um, this is another thing that SVP can do for you. So the upside down A and the backwards E, if you're not familiar, they're actually not the upside down A and the backwards E. These two are actually the backwards of each other. So if you use the top one and you say for all, that's a proof. That's saying for all possible inputs, is this the case? And if we flip it around and we use the backwards E, that exists. So is there anything that satisfies this? So this is like the original SAT problem. Is there any assignment of, of variables that makes this statement true? Uh, and what that gives you when you plug it into an SMT solver is you can do constraint programming problems. So, how many people remember this one from middle school? Or yeah, if you haven't seen the book. Okay, maybe it's a country thing. Uh, anyway. This, the problem you get is you have uh, send plus one or equals one, and each letter corresponds to a single digit, and each letter is a unique digit, and you have to figure out the correspondence between letters and digits that makes the addition sum true, or make, set, makes it a correct problem. So, <coughs> classic constraint programming problem, and it's not very hard to set up. We're still in the symbolic reasoning on it, the same one we use to talk about proofs. Um, and we're just going to get some integers that correspond to our letters, just like we did with our state vector that we were reasoning about. <coughs> we have a little logic in here that constrains ourselves to single digits. And Val just, if you get a length of the digits in a row, it will calculate the actual number, right? Uh, so send more and money. Just the, the summed values of these logic variables. 
So we say uh, each of these digits has to be a single digit, or each of these numbers has to be a single digit. They have to be distinct. S and M can't be zero because that would sort of make it a de degenerate problem. And this is the teacher gets very upset for this on uh, middle school. I, I tried that one. Uh, so, and then, <clears throat> not that hard, 10 plus more equals money. And this one doesn't take too long. Um, in general, constraints solving are much faster than proving because <clears throat> you're saying it exists and stuff for all. Questions? So, uh, just like with proofs, there's a ton of great examples in the SPP uh, Hedex. There's uh, Sudoku and Queens, all these sort of classic constraint problems. Uh, if this is interesting to you, uh, I encourage you to check it out. The code's pretty easy to read. This library is designed for doing exactly this, so most of the solutions are like, very straightforward to understand. Uh, and I'll just say a quick note about one other thing SPP can do. Um, Ben's a little more concerned. Have I let one way over time? It's not a long time. I thought I'd get two hours. <clears throat> no. <laughs> it's all, it's all sorry. Um, so we can do optimization too. This depends on the underlying SMT solver. So Z3, <clears throat> I think you can do this. Also has support for this kind of optimization. You can't do it on every underlying type, so you can't do it with floating point values, but you can do it with integers, you can do it with algebraic rails. So we can do just some simple major linear programming problem here. So we have two variables, and we want to know what's the what are the variable assignments that minimize this last expression x plus 2y subject to these constraints. It's not there's other software that's specialized for doing this that will probably solve it faster or can solve much bigger problems without falling over. But it's kind of cool that you can do this using the exact same uh, exact same infrastructure that we had for setting up the problem. So one thing I could do with this is I could take my controller and I, I instead of giving it a nominal system to improve stability, I could say, hey, what's the longest and shortest pendulum length for which this is stable? Or you know, questions like this. So this is kind of interesting. Does that just use simplex or is it something that uh, no it doesn't use simplex. It's it works the same way as the rest of the sets all right. So uh, it just has some actions built into it about the underlying theory that you're using whatever like whatever logic mode you're in to describe this last formula. And, and yeah, I don't think it's just doing simplex. Because you can mix a bunch of stuff together. Um, okay, so I, I don't know, it's not very interesting to see, but you know, find the answer is Okay, uh, that's all I wanted to tell you about SMT solving and SPD. 
uh, if you want to learn more. Wikipedia has good, a good overview of sort of the theory. It talks a little bit about the algorithms that are used, but not a lot. You probably have to dig deeper if you want to find out how these solvers are doing what they do. We didn't talk about it at all. I, don't, I barely know anything about it. Um, but here are some home pages for some of the things we've talked about. Uh, these slides are up and the code, including the code that was used to simulate, which I didn't show, and various other things are all up. If you want to take a look. Uh, any more questions? Okay, uh, Carlo has something he wants to say. Yeah. 